Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a new relative of Anomalocaris has been discovered in the Burgess Shale of Canada, a new species of Canadian elasmosaur has just been named, more evidence for the role of epigenetics in the process of evolution has been documented, and much more. Our top story this week is the fantastic discovery of a new species of radiodont, a group of very ancient arthropods that includes the famous Anomalocaris, along with a multitude of other prehistoric oddities, such as the filter-feeding Tamesiocaris and Adriacasis. Now, paleontologists have added another member to this fascinating lineage of swimming arthropods, a species they have named Mosura fentani. The name Mosura references Mothra due to its perceived moth-like appearance. It was a small species measuring between 1.5 and 6.1 centimeters in total length based on the fossils currently known. That's about 0.6 to 2.4 inches. It was uncovered from rocks in the Burgess Shale, the same rocks where Anomalocaris itself was discovered, meaning it's about 508 million years old. The head of Mosura is relatively short and rounded, bearing three prominent eyes. Emerging from the head are the appendages, which in this species were not utilized for filter feeding, like in some other radiodonts, but were instead suited for a predatory lifestyle. The appendages were equipped with six elongated spines, each ending in bifurcated tips, perfect for trapping prey that it likely caught as it swam freely in the water column. Like other radiodonts, Mosura also had swimming flaps down its sides and a mouth resembling a pineapple ring. However, Mosura is unique among all other radiodonts in terms of the anatomy of the rear part of its body. While other species typically had blades or filaments of some sort constituting the back of the body, Mosura possesses an elongated abdomen-like region, comprising 16 tightly packed segments lined with gills. The presence of this specialized body region suggests that Mosura had more efficient respiratory functions than other radiodonts, indicating that it may have led a particularly active lifestyle. It's also a pretty cool example of convergent evolution, as specialized respiratory regions at the back of the body, like this, can also be found in horseshoe crabs, isopods, and insects. So it's a brilliant new addition to the fossil record. And that's not the only prehistoric discovery from Canada we've got this week, as a new species of elasmosaur has just been described from Vancouver Island. This marine reptile is a kind of long-necked plesiosaur, and the bones of this species were first uncovered from late Cretaceous-aged rocks on Vancouver Island in the early 2000s. The fossils have been on display at the Courtney and District Museum for a number of years, and funnily enough, I actually got to see them in person back in 2023. Here are some of my photos. Anyway, the species is named Trascosaura sandrae, and three different individuals are described in this paper. One of these is a poorly preserved but essentially complete skeleton of an adult, while another is a partial skeleton of a juvenile that's preserved better, and the third one is a single arm bone. Trascosaura is described as showing a strange mixture of features shared with a variety of other plesiosaur species, suggesting the new animal is a fairly basal elasmosaur but has convergently evolved several features with more derived or advanced lineages. Trascosaura would have had a very long neck with probably more than 50 individual bones making up this structure, and the combination of features seen in its limbs suggests it was good at swimming downwards very quickly, so perhaps this was a special that helped with hunting its fishy prey from above. A wonderful new species. There's a new dinosaur in town this week as well. A new kind of sauropod dinosaur has been discovered from the Middle Jurassic of China, dating to about 165 million years ago. It's called Jinchuan Lung Niedu, and is represented by a partial skeleton that includes a rather magnificent skull. Skulls are always exciting finds for sauropods, as they tend to be very rarely preserved. The skeleton indicates this was a fairly basal, early diverging sauropod, and this particular individual was likely a subadult measuring some 10 meters in length, or about 33 feet. Jinchuan Lung is a brilliant discovery that adds another piece to the puzzle of sauropod evolution, filling out the evolutionary tree with even more species, and it's particularly significant for enriching the known diversity of early branching sauropods that existed during this specific time in prehistory. In other news, a paper published in the journal Science has identified a rather curious binary star system. It has been suggested in the past that a binary star system could exist where the stars orbit so close to one another that one star is actually within the outer layers of the other. Well, the star system identified in this paper features a millisecond pulsar, 
a neutron star that is spinning enormously fast, completing a full spin every 10.55 milliseconds. Its companion star has an orbital period of 3.6 hours, and it is believed to be a stripped helium star, having much of its other mass stripped away by the cataclysmic forces involved in its orbit. Using stellar models, the authors found that the system as it is observed today would likely have formed after an unstable transfer of mass from the companion, now helium star, to the neutron star, triggering the formation of this common envelope that the helium now orbits inside of. This kind of star system, of course, is thought to be extremely rare, but researchers don't believe this is the only one of its type in the galaxy. Instead, predicting that there could be between 16 and 84 in the Milky Way alone. Stepping back to Earth now, where scientists have developed a technology that allows humans to see better through their own eyes. Well, through their eyelids. Perhaps more importantly, this tech allows humans to see multiple wavelengths of infrared light. Within the electromagnetic spectrum of wavelengths, visible light sits, and it is this visible light, as the name suggests, that humans can pick up with their eyes, allowing us to see. Just outside this spectrum lies infrared light, which we can't see, but still very much exists. Well, now scientists have developed contact lenses that allow humans to see high levels of infrared light allowing the wearer to see the infrared radiation from an LED light that shines infrared light. As near-infrared light goes through your eyelid better than visible light, infrared light is seen more easily through the eyelid. In fact, it was easier for participants of the tests of these contact lenses to see the infrared being beamed into their eye when their eyes were closed, as there was less interference from the visible light spectrum. The team that have developed this hope to refine the design further to allow a contact lens with more precise spatial resolution and higher sensitivity. And finally for the news this week, there's been a particularly intriguing and very well done study that demonstrates how changes to DNA sequences are not the only factors contributing to the evolution of organisms. In the past few decades, it's been realized that in addition to mutations in DNA sequences, epigenetic changes may also play a role in evolution. Epigenetic changes are defined as alterations to gene expression that occur without changing the actual DNA sequence itself. Rather, chemical tags can be added or removed from DNA sequences, resulting in specific genes being turned on or off and these tags can be acquired or removed during the life of the organism. It's also been demonstrated that some of these epigenetic markers can be passed down from parent to offspring, suggesting that the way an organism lives and the environment to which it is exposed can lead to inherited changes in its progeny. The extent to which epigenetic factors contribute to the evolution of organisms is still debated, but now a landmark new study has provided convincing evidence that epigenetic changes in rice plants have enabled them to evolve greater cold resistance. The decade-long study identified a variety of cultivated Asian rice plants that was particularly sensitive to cold climates, and subjected these plants to cold conditions for seven days, just as they were beginning to reproduce, before returning them to a more suitable temperature. The researchers then collected seeds from the plants that produced the most, and repeated this with the next generation. Remarkably, by the third generation, one of the plant varieties was producing many more seeds, indicating that it had adapted to the cold stress very quickly. The researchers were able to rule out that this cold adaptability was caused by differences in DNA sequences between generations, convincingly showing that it is in fact due to the removal of chemical tags at the start of one specific gene. This is a truly astonishing study, demonstrating how the environment can direct epigenetic changes in organisms that are then inherited by their offspring for several generations. It will be very exciting to see more studies like this as researchers continue to explore the impact of epigenetics on evolution. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, Diana Hernandez, Drift Shri Gustava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prijka Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikus, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.